Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to start off by talking about weapon design and weapon versatility. When designing a weapon of war, I think there are two major points that can help it succeed. One is how effective it is at one singular task, and the other is how many different tasks it can perform. As an example of the former, we can look at something like bombers. Bombers, like the B-29 Super Fortress, as per the name, are incredibly effective at dropping bombs, having a massive, heavy body loaded with all kinds of explosives. Bombers can drop thousands to tens of thousands of pounds of explosives, absolutely devastating as an air-to-ground weapon. However, because of their sheer size, they are generally slow and lumbering, and as a result, are very vulnerable to enemy aircraft. Even being outfitted with defensive turrets, as most bombers are, bombers generally need fighter support or already established aerial superiority to be able to really do their job. Bombers were really good at their one task of attacking the ground, but only that task really. For an example of the latter, we can look at combination fighter bombers. Fighter bombers like the F-4U Corsair or the P-47 Thunderbolt are more variable in what they can perform and may not necessarily excel at any one specific task, but the fact that it can do a multitude of things gives it a real edge in warfare overall. Fighter bombers may not be good as aircraft designed purely for air-to-air -air combat, nor are they as good as a pure bomber for air-to-ground combat, but the fact that it can do both decently enough make them useful weapons overall. Again, maybe not amazing in any one area, but at least proficient in a lot of them. So, what happens when a weapon of war gets made that can really be considered neither of these things? What happens when a weapon is so niche, but so ineffective in that niche? Well, it doesn't really succeed, to spoil the answer there. It's something that has no real point in even existing. It's one of these weapons that I want to talk about now, a weapon so niche and probably ineffective that it would never even be made, but lives on in artist renderings, scale models, and our hearts. This is the Martin Baker Tank Buster. In early 1942, the British military wanted a new aircraft that would be used primarily in an air-to-ground role. Their main plane for this role at the time was the Hawker Hurricane Mark IId, armed with two 40mm Vickers S-guns and two Browning machine guns. They wanted something with more overall firepower than this, something that could hold even more S-guns or bigger guns while still being able to attack a variety of targets like enemy aircraft, tanks, ships, and even infantry. They would make an official call to action to aircraft manufacturers for a new plane in this role on March 7, 1942, adding in the stipulations that it needed to be able to reach a speed of at least 280 miles an hour, and it needed excellent forward visibility. Essentially, the British just called for a new ground attack plane that was versatile enough to do basically anything they really needed it to. The folks over at the Martin Baker Aircraft Company saw this request and decided to go outside the box a bit. Uh, quite a bit, actually. Instead of making that versatile ground attacker that the British military wanted, they decided to make a plane that would be used explicitly for tanks and nothing else. The initial design of the Martin Baker Tank Buster would be armed with just a single gun, a 6-pounder, or 57mm, cannon, mounted on the very nose of the plane with 30 rounds of ammunition in store. This initial design did not have any other listed weapons, despite scale models of it frequently showing wing-mounted bombs, the initial design did not have this. Its initial design did not have any other way to attack or any way to defend itself against enemy aircraft, and would have to rely completely on fighter protection or pre-established aerial superiority. It didn't even have a simple machine gun, just that cannon. Trying to account for this overall lack of defensive weaponry and the likelihood of anti-aircraft guns on the ground, the tank buster would be fully covered with half-inch thick armor plating. This plating would end up weighing almost 5,000 pounds by itself. Combine that with its projected size at 41 feet long and 47 feet 10 inches wide, 
and its listed engine being a Rolls-Royce Griffin II engine with 1,730 horsepower, this would limit its top speed to just 270 miles an hour, 10 miles an hour under the military's requirement, and still pretty slow regardless. Still though, the Tank Buster did have a couple things going for it. For one, it used its engine in a pusher configuration, giving the pilot excellent forward visibility as was required. Additionally, it was outfitted with very wide, flat wings and a twin boom tail, which would give it pretty good stability and control at lower altitudes, and given that its main target would be tanks, this made the most sense design-wise. Plus, the 57mm cannon was a pretty strong gun in 1942. Not the best, mind you, but still pretty powerful as far as tank guns go, and it likely would have done some pretty good damage if it connected with its target. Plus, with the plane striking the target from above, it would be able to avoid the bulk of the armor plating on the body of the tank. Still though, the gun itself would have a pretty limited range overall, so it would make actually hitting the target a bit of a challenge. Apparently, there were later attempts to diversify the weaponry it had a little bit, and they added some bombs underneath the wings, making the plane more accurate to the current scale models that we see, but while this would have given the Tank Buster a bit more versatility in what it could do, it would have also increased the weight and made it even slower than it already was. And so, as a result of being so limited in what it could be used for, how slow it was, and how mediocre in all likelihood, it would have been compared to bombers, fighter bombers, and already existing ground attack craft, the Tank Buster would never make it past the drawing board. In fact, every single project proposal that would be submitted to the British military's request would never come to fruition. Instead, the British military elected to continue with upgrades to the Hawker Hurricane, which culminated in the Mark IV. Towards the end of the war, the Hawker Typhoon was selected to replace it for the ground attack role, it being faster and more powerful than any version of the Hurricane. With Martin and Baker's Tank Buster project completely falling flat, they would continue to work on a line of aircraft that resulted in what was known as the Martin Baker MB-5. This project, a single-seat propeller-powered fighter, would unfortunately never come to fruition, but the single prototype model that they made showed incredible promise. With a top speed of 460 miles an hour, test pilots would report that the MB-5 was very easy to control, and was overall very well constructed and well designed. However, with the first flight of the MB-5 occurring in May 1944, it was effectively halted by an increase in interest and investment in jet engine technology. So, sadly for Martin Baker, their combat aircraft in the war amounted to very little in the end. But on a lighter note for them, towards the end of the war, they would receive another request from the British government to look into ejector seat technology. This led them to eventually being a leader in ejector seat technology over the next several decades. Their advancements in ejector seat technology ended up being highly influential and widespread. So at least one thing that they did during the war worked out in the end. The Tank Buster, though, just didn't work out. It wasn't a good weapon, and it just ultimately failed. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching the video. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, all the usual stuff. The Tank Buster was such a weirdly specific idea that I kind of knew I had to make a video on it as soon as I learned about it, and there's not a ton of information on it out there. No YouTube videos I could find either. But anyway, I hope you liked the video, I hope you watch my next one, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.